going to uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke. The Gospel according to Luke. Uh, we're going to be looking at a section in chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, uh, as we continue in, continue in our series, Who is Your One? Luke chapter 5. We'll begin with verse 12. Um, so the passage, is, the passage we'll be looking at today is verses 17 through 26. But, um, well, maybe we'll just read 17 through 26, and we'll reference chapter, or verse 12 as we go along. The passage says, One day he, that is Jesus, was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea, and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with the stretcher into the middle of the crowd <clears throat> in front of Jesus. Seeing a faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins have been forgiven you? Or to say, Get up and walk. But, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God, and they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you so much uh, for your goodnesses to us. Thank you for allowing us to meet together, uh, circumstances notwithstanding. Thank you, Father, for your word and the way in which your word guides us and uh, informs our choices and allows us to see very clearly who you are and to adore your son, the Lord Jesus. And uh, Father, now as we have spent a brief part of this morning uh, talking about your word and discussion in Sunday school and, and just singing about you and your person and your goodnesses to us, reading the scriptures together, praying together, uh, Father, thank you now that we're able to sit at your feet and allow you to speak to us. And Father, what a privilege that is. To hear from heaven. Uh, Father, still our hearts. Uh, allow us to focus and give good attention to you as you speak to us from your word. Divine Satan, as we always ask. Because we want your word to have free course. We don't want any hindrances or distractions to keep us from hearing from heaven. And Father, allow us, by your grace, to be doers of that word. Uh, even before we hear it, may we determine that what Thus saith the Lord is exactly what we will do. And as always, Father, in that way, uh, we will be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the thanksgiving. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, as I said, we are going through, with, we're in the second part of our series on Who is Your One? Uh, the title, the next slide, uh, simply talks about healing the paralytic, healing the paralytic. Now, I want to begin, as I always do, uh, with a bit of a story. It says, Glenn Wolf recently died alone in Los Angeles at the age of 88. No one came to claim his body. The city paid to have him buried in an unmarked grave. 
This is sad, but not unusual. It happens all too often in large cities where people tend to live disenfranchised lives. Glenn's situation was unique, though, because he was no ordinary man. He held a world record. The Guinness Book listed him as the most married man, with 29 marriages to his credit. This means 29 times he was asked, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife, forsaking all others? Do you pledge yourself only to her as long as you both shall live? 29 times Glenn said, I do. But it never quite worked out that way. He died, leaving behind children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, a number of living ex-wives and an innumerable ex-in-laws, and still he died alone. He spent his entire adult life looking for something he apparently never found, and he died alone. Glenn Wolf is an extreme example of how people spend their lives drifting in and out of marriages, in and out of relationships, only to find themselves isolated and alone. Glenn Wolf shows us how important it is to have friends. Eminem had, as the lyrics of one of his songs, If I Had, he says, what are friends? Friends are people that you think are your friends, but they're really your enemies, with secret identities and disguises to hide their true colors. So just when you think you're close enough to be brothers, they want to come back and cut your throat when you ain't looking. That's a pessimistic look of friends. The Bible does not describe genuine friends in that way. How do you know when you have a good friend? Well, someone said, a friend is one who won't reveal secrets about you, even though tempted with money or with chocolate. A friend is one who knows all about you, but loves you anyway. A friend is someone who does their knocking before they come in, instead of after they leave. A friend is someone who hides those pictures that make you look like a beached whale. And I'm getting closer and closer to needing that kind of friend myself. As we think about friendship, we think about all that Jesus models. And Jesus, of course, is the ultimate friend but God has given us genuine friends around us. We all need friends. And in this particular passage, we see what real friendship looks like. And I want us to tease that out for just a minute. In the next slide, I put down three factors in the life of Jesus. Uh, in preparation, going back to verse 12, I just want to point out three things about him. Uh, just to make the point, I, I trust at the end, that Jesus is the ultimate friend. Jesus is my best friend. And there are at least three things about my best friend that stand out to me in this passage. In verse 12, <clears throat> Jesus, of course, is in Capernaum. And, and if you go back even to the beginning of the chapter, uh, he gets into a boat. He's teaching the people. And, and when he gets done, he says to Simon, cast your net on the other side. We looked at this. And they drew in all of these fish. And, and Simon Peter said, depart from me, man. Lord, I'm a wicked man. You know, he says, don't be afraid for now. You're going to catch people. And you know, all of that took place. But then after all of that, we get down to verse 12. And while he's in this region, it says here, while he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I don't know how much you know about leprosy and in the Bible, leprosy was an incurable disease. When leprosy affected an individual because of its contagious nature, we think the coronavirus is contagious, but leprosy, if you got that, there was no cure for that. And of course, your immune system uh, could not fight it off like it can with the virus. But when a person contracted leprosy, 
God commanded that they separate themselves from others, and even if someone was approaching them, they had to cover themselves and say, unclean, unclean. They had to let everybody know that they were not safe to be around. This man was a leper. This man was used to being alone. This man was used to not having any friends around him who could be close to him. He was an isolated, lonely man. And of course, because uh, leprosy was so contagious, nobody would touch him. They wouldn't even uh, fist bump him or uh, elbow him. They wouldn't touch this guy at all. But I want you to notice, first of all, Jesus, I want you to notice his compassion. He says to the Lord, he says, if, if you're willing, if you, if you want to, he says, you can make me clean. He doesn't say, Lord, I, I want to be clean. I want to be healed. I want you to do it. He didn't ask the Lord to do anything. He just said, listen, if, if, if you want to, you can, you can heal me. And look what it says here in verse 13. And Jesus could have said, okay, be it unto you according to your faith. Because he's done that, right? He could say, go your way, like he did with the ten. And as they were going, they were cleansed. He could have done that, but that's not what he did with his leper. The scripture says here, he stretched out his hand and he did the unthinkable. He, he touched him. And he said, I want to be healed. And that, that shows how compassionate the Lord is. He, he could have done it from a distance, but he chose to be close. He, closed, he chose to, to touch the man who was untouchable. And I tell you what, I, I, there was a day in my life when because of my sin I was untouchable. But you know, Jesus came and, and, and he cared about me. Not from a distance. But he came to be a close and to touch my life. I, I see his compassion and I'm just struck by that. There's another thing, next slide, that I'm, I'm struck by. Uh, not only his compassion, but I want you to notice something. Uh, after this, it, it's after he tells the man, go show yourself to a priest and all of this. Verse 15 says, the news about it was spreading even farther. Large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. But would you notice what it says here in verse 16? It says Jesus, he, was, he had this habit of just quietly slipping away from the crowd and spending time with the Father in prayer. That was what he often did. That was a habitual thing with him. Jesus, he was comfortable with the crowd. But listen, Jesus was also even more comfortable getting away from the crowd, getting into the presence of the Father and spending time with him in prayer. You know, I, I read that and I thought about my own paltry prayer life. And I thought about how often I spend a lot of time doing a lot of things with a lot of other people and how little time I spend with the God who made all people. And I'm reminded of the saying, to be little with God is to be little for God. To be much with God is to be much for God. And because Jesus was in the habit of constantly slipping away and spending time in the Father's presence, then it doesn't surprise us that when we get down into verse 17, this is one day he was teaching and, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law and it says at the end of the verse, the power of the Lord was present with him to perform healing. It doesn't surprise us that the power of God was available on his life because he spent so much time in the Father's presence. Now, of course, Jesus is God. Of course, he's always going to have power to heal, but I think it's significant that Luke says it this way because he wants us to get the connection between Jesus spending time in the Father's presence and the Father being present by his Spirit in his life at the time of need. I want to say this to you because I say this to myself. Listen, I want to see God do things in my life. I want to see God use my life. Now think about that one 
that God is pressing on my heart and into my mind and, and bringing across my path in my life, I want to say this to you. If I want to see the power of God break him free from his sin, I'm going to have to be in prayer constantly. Those prayer guides that I put out for you, I hope, I hope that you pick up one and I hope that you turn the pages every day for 30 days. I hope when you see the blank, you insert the name of the person that you're praying for and that you pray for them daily, daily, daily. I hope that you trust in God to do something in the life of that one. And that's why I took the time to put the prayer guides out there. To be much with God is to be much for God. To be little with God is to be little for God. Jesus modeled the priority of prayer in his life. The third thing about Jesus that is so noteworthy is his authority. Now, now this comes out again. We'll see in a little bit when we get down to verse 24 because he says that you might know that the Son of Man has authority. Christ has all authority. Did he not say in Matthew uh, 28, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. And on the basis of that delegated authority, I'm delegating to you and telling you go and make disciples. Jesus demonstrated that he has all authority. He's asleep in the boat. The disciples are scared, spitless. And, and they're crying out. They wake him up, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? We're about to drown here. And you're asleep. And he gets up and you know the story. He speaks to the waves and the wind and he says, hush, be still. And everything quiets now. And they're saying, what kind of man is this who has authority? Even the waves and the wind obey him. Jesus is the one who could, when the demon-possessed man comes to him and cries out, Why are you here? I know who you are, the Son of God. He says, Hush, come out of him. Instantly, the demons obey. He said, What kind of teaching is this? What kind of man is this? Even the demons obey everything he said. Listen, Jesus has all authority. It's because Jesus has all, has all authority. And because he's the king of my life, he's just saying, God is in control. It's not over until he says it's over. Amen. Well, listen, if that's true, then see, I don't have to worry as I go out of here. I don't have to worry about the fact that Walmart has run out of all the hand sanitizer and the toilet paper. I'm not worried about that virus. I have never worried about that virus. You know, listen, we get flu shots all the time. I got a flu shot. I, I got one because my boss said, let me give you a flu shot. And if she hadn't done that, I wouldn't have gotten a flu shot. Is it that I don't believe in flu shots? I'm like, well, okay. Listen, here's where I understand my virus, all right? Now, I've, I've been accused of being uh, irresponsible. Even in talking with my kids last night, we had our family chat on the weekend. It's like, oh, well, you know dad, right? Dad, he doesn't listen to anybody. His dad's pink-headed, right? Okay, but listen, viruses, I mean, viruses run in the van, okay? Viruses, they get into your system, they attach to your RNA, and they reverse transcribe. That is, instead of the RNA dictating to the virus what it should do, the virus translates to the RNA, this is what I want you to do. I want you to repeat, replicate my gene sequence. And the virus informs the RNA, which then takes it to the DNA, and the DNA begins to mass produce all of these cells that look like the virus in the sequential coding. But God has given you an army, your antibody, your, your immune system, which goes on a search and destroy mission when it sees something that doesn't look normal. It calls up reserve, they quarantine, they isolate, they destroy those viruses. Listen, it takes five to seven days for the virus to get in and do its reverse transcription and get the body to mass produce its own. And then when the tiger gets big, you know, you get the sniffles, you get the sneezes, you get the hacking, right? And you don't feel so good and all that good stuff. It takes your body about five days to spot it, build an army, take it out. And then you're right back on your feet. And you're good again. 
And because you have a specific antibody for that virus, anytime that virus comes in, your body zaps it. You're not going to have to worry about that virus ever again. That's normal. It happens all the time. This novel virus, this coronavirus, okay, so they've not seen one like this before, but they've seen viruses before. The only really dangerous virus, well, I, I, I shouldn't use the word dangerous because there have been people that have died. The people who've died from the virus are all people who are what we would call immunosuppressed, right? Their immune system has been compromised, and so they're more prone to being overwhelmed. But the most dangerous virus that's ever existed was the one for AIDS because the AIDS virus is specifically targeted your immune system. And so it would create, mass create defective antibodies. And so the person who got that virus, they would find that their immune system got weaker, weaker, weaker until eventually it became non-existent. The person who had AIDS, they died not from the virus, but from AIDS-related causes. That is, they, their body was so weak that any bacteria or any kind of virus that was around could overwhelm them because they had no defense system. And so that made sense to fight against that virus aggressively. But then once we discovered that that virus tended to be specific for people who engaged in a certain lifestyle, right, homosexual, and people who were bisexual, uh, who were practicing and contracted the virus in a homosexual uh, uh, activity, and then transmitted it to someone uh, heterosexually, you know, those people and those who shared uh, uh, needles and got into their blood system because they were, just those were the people who primarily got the virus, then we weren't worried about that. There was a lot of hoopla about AIDS, and they, they came up with all these expensive anti-AIDS drugs, but the average person who lives a decent moral lifestyle will never get AIDS. So we don't worry about that. Listen, this, this virus, if, if it comes in contact with you, and you have a reasonably healthy immune system, okay, so it'll get into your system, you have seven days, and then you get the sniffles and the sneezes, your nose will run, you take something uh, like uh, Sudafed or a Claritin D or something, and then three days later it'll be down in your chest, and you take something like Robitussin honey or Robitussin DM or something, or Mucinex, and then it'll be gone. And you don't have to worry about it again. So why the mass hysteria? If you're going to go through a 14-day regimen, with this virus, you're going to come out on the other side and you'll never have to worry about it again. So why do you have to buy a bottle of toilet paper, right? I mean, I, if I had known this was going to happen, I would have invested in Procter & Gamble and made some money off all that toilet paper they were selling. But, you know, it's, it's just why this, this is not really germane to what we're talking about. My point is, Jesus has all authority. There's no reason for me to live in fear. And I understand enough about how the body works and the body's immune system to know that, listen, I don't have to fear that. I mean, besides the fact that I'm on assignment, right? I'm on assignment. Listen, I mean, this sounds crazy. And of course, my kids can tell me I'm crazy, but I'm, a, I'm indestructible until it's my time. Really. I mean, when it's my time to go, I'm gone. Virus or no virus. Right? If it's not the virus, it'll be a gunshot or somebody coming across the line. You, when it's my time to go, I'm gone. Until it's my time to go, there isn't a virus alive that can take me out. Because it's not my time. So I, I, I don't ever live in fear like that. And I, I guess I don't understand why people who name the name of Christ, who say that Christ has all authority, somehow can't believe that he has the authority to protect them. But that's, like I said, that, I, I'm being uh, socially irresponsible, according to some. But I'd say to them, no, you're living. You know, you're just running. Why? Because everybody else is running. You don't know why you're running. You're just running because everybody else is too. Social media and the internet has created all of this frenzy because they're reporting all of this stuff. And you read that stuff and say, well, everybody else is scared. Maybe I should be scared too. Okay. I got that off my chest. <laughs> I'm
I'm sorry. Jesus has all authority. And, and the reason that's so important to me is because, listen, when I, I think about friendship, and I said to your friend, Jesus is my best friend. But look at my best friend. He is compassionate. He has all authority. And he's, he's close, he's near to me. If, if there was anybody that was going to be a true friend, if there's anybody that I wanted to introduce people to who would be a true friend, then there's no better friend than Jesus. And I think about the people on my list. I think about the one. And I think about the fact that, you know what? Uh, as they live their lives in isolation, as they live their lives in desperation, as they live their lives just trying to piece together some meaning, listen, I know someone who will be a friend to them like no other friend. And that's Jesus. If I really want to demonstrate love to my friend, you know what I'll do? I'll introduce them to Jesus. In the story, we have some intriguing things. Uh, the, the next slide, Carl, I, I put three factors about the religious leaders because you look at the way Luke lays this out. In verse 17, it says he was teaching uh, one day and, and he just happens to mention that there were Pharisees and uh, religious teachers there, teachers of the law, the scribes, they were there. And this is the first time Luke ever even mentions this group, but this group, they dogged Jesus all of his three years of ministry. I mentioned three things, three factors about the religious leaders because there's a point I wanted to make. Number one, uh, they knew much, but they cared little. Uh, Jesus, Jesus talked about how meticulous they were in keeping the law, but they would actually use their traditions to circumvent the law. And he says in, in, Luke, in Matthew 23, he says they would bind up all these commandments like bundles and they would lay them on the backs of the people. They would weigh the people down with all of these traditions and laws to keep. But he said you would not even so much as help lift them with your little finger. You don't care about people. They knew a lot. But they didn't care much at all. Secondly, Oh, they oppressed these. People thought that the Pharisees were the most religiously upright people in existence. But they didn't have any power. Listen, in this particular story, as we see as it unfolds, these people, they were there. They were constant critics of Jesus. But, you know, they couldn't do anything for this man. The fact that they had the position meant nothing when it came to meeting the need of this man. The third thing I put, they were Jesus' worst critics. They were the worst critics. I put that because I put this, see what I put down here in red? They had the least good to say about him. Sometimes people who are religious, sometimes people who are spiritual, sometimes people who, who talk about all of this stuff is, Praise God, praise Jesus, be blessed. But sometimes in their lives, they don't really have good things to say about Jesus because they're not really submitted to him. They're not willing to follow him. They're not really surrendered to his lordship. They speak ill about him. And as I say, these people, they, they couldn't help this man. Fortunately for him, he had four friends. He had four friends. As the story untold unfolds here, it says in verse 18, some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. This man could not move. This was the bed, this was the cot, literally, that you would normally sit on when you ate or recline on when you took a nap. This man was paralyzed. He could never, ever get up. There was nothing he could do on his own, but he had friends around him who cared deeply about him. And because they were true friends to him, you know, they did these things. First thing I want to point out is that these, these four friends, four facts about the friends, is that these, these men, they had a mission. You know, we always talk about mission statements. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the fact that Jesus himself 
Yeah, the mission statement, Luke uh, 1910, right? The Son of Man has come to, to seek and, and to save that which was lost. And because Jesus has a mission statement, then I have my own personal mission statement to be used by God to accomplish, um, to be difference makers and introducing people to Christ and to evangelize, remove the barriers that stand between people and a correct understanding of who God is and what he desires from their life. And all of that, these men had a mission. Their mission was how do we get our friend to Jesus? Because they, they understood something that you and I have become convinced of as well, is that Jesus is the solution. Jesus is not a solution. Jesus is not a fix. He is the ultimate solution to the problems that plague people on their deepest level. And their mission in life was to get their friend to Jesus. So, I asked the question next slide. So, some questions to ponder. I'm going to ask them really quickly because our time is getting away. I spent all my time ranting about the coronavirus. I apologize for that. Uh, the questions I, I put down for them. Number one, what, what drives you? What drives you? What is it that, that causes you to think, listen, when I get up in the morning, today I want to see God do X, Y, or Z in my life? Number two, what thing spiritually has God put on your heart that you long to see come to fruition in your lifetime? Do, do, have you thought at length about the things that you would really want to see God do into, for, through you in your life? And have you, have you given it a lot of consideration? And is it directing the affairs and choices of your life? Number three, do you have kingdom dreams, such as people coming to faith in Christ? You know, sometimes you have dreams and a monster's chasing you, and you, you're running, but you can't seem to get away from it. And then you wake up and say, man, what was that about, right? I don't know. You buy a pizza at night. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you sometimes we have weird dreams. But did you ever dream about sharing the gospel with friends? Do you have a dream about what it would be like to have that one come to faith in Christ? Or are your dreams all tied to this life? You dream about hitting the lottery, making a lot of money, uh, you know, having people call your name in fabulous uh, ways. And the last question, when was the last time you stopped to think about those dreams? When was the last time you stopped to think about them? These men had a mission. It was a simple mission. The mission was to get the one that they cared about, Jesus. The next slide, I put a second fact of the four facts. These men had an eager expectation. Now, it just so happens that these men were convinced of something. These men were convinced that, you know what, if, if we could just get him to Jesus, he would be okay. And so, I mean, they, they, I mean, there's four of them that we're assuming. It may have been more that, that decided to do it, but there were just these four that carried him. And so they said, listen, we, we can't pick him up, put him around our shoulder and walk with him because he can't do anything. Let's carry him. Now, we don't know how far they journey, but I don't think he was right around the corner. But it didn't matter. They said, even though Jesus might be across town, if we want him to come to Jesus, then we're going to have to do it. Notice how their expectation that Jesus could solve the problem drove them to spare no effort to get their friend to Jesus. I like that. I think about my own life and the people that I've had opportunity to talk to over the years and I'm like, Lord, you know, a lot of those people, I, I just gave them little snippets of the gospel. But, you know, I said to myself, I don't want to be pushy, and I backed away from giving them full disclosure. And sometimes I did that, and I never got to see that person again. It's heartbroken, you know. But there are some people, my neighbor, I mean, he's been my neighbor for 28 years. And for 28 years, I said, you know, one of these days, I got I to gotta share the gospel with him. And, you know, I've been in his home, and I, I went there on, in, on, under the cover, 
well, not I when I said undercover, what I meant was I was I was teaching EE. And so I said, well, for EE, we need to go and visit people so I could model for the people I'm training the gospel and how to share it. So I deliberately went to my friend's house so I could say, well, I can, can I just tell you what I'm teaching them to say with someone else so I can share the gospel with them. And, uh, you know, as it turned out, I shared it with his wife, who's already in the church, and he got called away on the air, and I still wasn't able to do it. You know, and my plans just didn't work. You know, it's one of those things you just say, I got to get this done. And I still trust the Lord to do that. They had an eager anticipation or expectation. Excuse me. Couple of questions. Next slide, Carl. Uh, just, just two quick questions. Do you have an eager expectation of, of someone coming to faith? You say, well, you know, I know, I know, uh, Joe Blow. Uh, you know, he's been resistant over the years, and I don't know. Maybe he's not one of the elect. I don't know. You don't know. But I do know that Christ has called me to preach the gospel to every Christian. And that includes Joe Blow. So you have an expectation of them coming to faith. Does your expectation move you to action? And so uh, when I'm out cutting my grass and I see him out riding the lawnmower. <laughs> You know, then I have to stop cutting my grass and I have to walk over and say, how you doing? And strike up a conversation. You say, well, man, that, I mean, I'm just, that's going out on a limb. Well, that's okay. You should never be afraid to go out on a limb for God because, after all, that's where the fruit is. Fruit's always out on a limb. It's never in the trunk. You got to go out on a limb. And if I'm thinking about how desperately he needs Jesus, uh, then I will spare no effort to try to think of creative ways to get him under the hearing of God's prayer. And that includes picking up that prayer diary and praying for him and calling his name before the Lord is concerned. The third fact, you see these men, they encountered an obstacle. It says, they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of Jesus, but, but there's a crowd of people there. Not finding a way to bring him in because of the crowd. There were so many people standing around. They couldn't say, okay, let's move, move, move. Come on, move. Now, the crowd wasn't going to budge. And so they, we can't, we can't get it to Jesus. Now, you know what would have happened if that had been me? I would say, well, okay, apparently that's not what the Lord wants. And uh, turn around and took him back home. I'm sorry, dude. You know, but apparently there wasn't God's will for you to hear from Jesus today. But that's, that's not the loving thing. I mean, he's still paralyzed. These friends were true friends. They're like, okay, we came this way because we believe that Jesus is, is able to heal him. And these people are in our way, but, but we're not going to let these people keep us from getting him to Jesus. They pushed through the obstacle. All of the houses in that day, oh, they had flat roofs, and <clears throat> they erected beams, and then sometimes they put branches across them, sometimes they have a little gypsum, and, and you know, and what they did, because they had stairs going up to the roof, because the roof was flat, they said, hey, look, he's about, uh, he's about this section, just, and so they go, they measure off, they come down. You dig through this man's roof. You say, well, wait a minute now. I don't want nobody digging through my roof. Well, yeah. We probably would say, well, you know, if I knock on his door unannounced, uh, he, might, he might be doing something and he's not going to be appreciating me coming to his house. She's not going to be feeling me showing up. You know, you, you might talk yourself out of doing the thing that seems excessive. But that's not these men. They say, oh, no, no, no. We're not going to let this circumstance keep us from getting our friend to Jesus. And so they dug through the roof 
and they let him down right in front of Jesus. They didn't count an obstacle, but they didn't let the obstacle keep them from doing the thing that mattered for their friend. So, two questions. Number one, what obstacles have derailed you from the mission? You say, well, they, didn't, they weren't smiling today, and I didn't think it was a good time. Yeah, that could be. And you may say, well, you know, um, they were in a car accident, and um, you know, they got to get their car paid or, or repaired, and you know, it just doesn't seem like a good time, right? Or, or maybe, you know, the child is sick, and it doesn't seem like a good time. You know, I mean, you can think of all the reasons why uh, maybe this, this isn't a good time, but the question is, do you care enough to push through the obstacles that they might find Jesus? What would it look like for you to get a hold of Luke to push through and to say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going. I'm going because it matters. But notice the fourth thing. These men got more than they bargained for. They got more than they bargained for. It wasn't like they just dropped him down. He said, okay, boom, get up, and that's it. I love the fact that God has set this whole thing up because God wanted to not only do something for this man, he not only wanted to do something for his friends, he wanted to do something for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and he wanted to do something for the whole crowd. And none of it would have happened if the men had given up, and that's the thing that stands out in my thinking. Notice it says here, they dropped him down in front of Jesus. Verse 20 says, seeing their faith. Listen, that's the friend's faith. He said to the man, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. What a statement. Well, why would he say that? I mean, they, they didn't bring him there because he was deep in growth and sin. That's why he's paralyzed. Can I just diatribe for a second to say this? Sometimes we think that the deepest needs that people have are physical. Sometimes we think the deepest needs that people have are financial. Sometimes we think the deepest needs that people have are psychological. Listen, the deepest needs that people have are always spiritual. Jesus doesn't begin with healing the body. He begins with the deeper need. He heals the soul. And then, from there, he takes care of the body. And I like that priority. Spirituality matters. And because he was able to, to do that, the Pharisees, those people that thought they knew a lot but had no answers, verse 21, who is this man who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus, aware of their reasoning, told them, listen, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Only God can read thoughts. I know what you're thinking. Why are you reasoning that way in your heart? Which is easy to say. Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, get up and walk. Neither one of them is any harder than the other. In other words, I deliberately said it this way. So that you can reach an understanding of who I am. I am the one who forgives sin. And then he says to the man, okay, so you can know that the Son of Man has authority. He says, I say to you, get up, this pick, get up, pick up your stretcher and walk. The man was able to do it. Spiritual healing, then physical restoration. And of course, you would think that the religious leaders would have been able to say, oh, wow, we have to rethink who we think he is. But no, blinded by their own pride, they refuse to acknowledge who he is. It says in verse 25, immediately he got up from before him, picked up what he had been lying on, and went home glorifying God. I like that. Luke takes his time to describe that situation. I think because Luke is, he's making the point, you, you know, uh, there was a time when the cop was carrying the man. But Jesus turned all that around and 
No, he tells the man, carry the cot. I like that. When he's carrying that thing on his shoulder and people are saying, man, what you doing? He said, listen, there was a time that I was lying on this cot, paralyzed, and I could not move. Well, what did you do? Did you have some, some kind of a massage therapy or acupuncture? No, listen, it was Jesus. Jesus healed me. Right? And every time they saw him, and they remember that's the guy carried the car. Jesus healed him. He used to be totally paralyzed. When he got back home, and his family said, Whoa, you're walking. What happened? I want to tell you, my four friends carried me to Jesus. And Jesus healed me. When he's out on his job, they say, Oh, we didn't think you'd ever be back again. Because you couldn't move. He said, listen, I was down. But Jesus lifted me up. And all of the people that knew him, he was able to testify to them about the difference that Jesus made. See, sometimes God allows you to be in that difficult circumstance. He said, I don't know. I thought he loved me. I don't know why he let me go through this. But then when he delivers you, it becomes a permanent part of a testimony of praise to him. And you can tell people, listen, I've been there. I've been down. But I want to tell you, Jesus lifted me up. That is your testimony. And that brings glory to God. And that's why he does it. They got more than they bargained for. Look what happened in the lives of everybody because they cared for one man. What is God going to do in the lives of all the people attached to that one person that you want to see God bring to Christ? You see, if they come to faith, every family member, all the cousins and uncles and all the folk attached, they're going to all hear about the fact that Jesus changed us. Question to ponder as we wrap this thing up. How did others play a role in you trusting Jesus? Remember what it was like? Remember how there were people that you didn't even know that God was going to use who came along and spoke the word of God to you? Remember the person who modeled Christ in front of you? Maybe they never got to say anything to you, but they began to cause you to be inquisitive about the faith. You remember a role that they played? In what ways has Jesus transformed your life? Do you have peace? Do you have joy? Do you have patience? Do you have self-control? Has Jesus filled your heart with kindness, goodness, faithfulness? If he's changed you, then just think what he can do in the life of that person that you're praying for. Why would you not long for this type of transformation? Why would you want them to experience all of the freedom and joy that you found in Jesus? Well, I tell you, finding that one is so important. Sharing Christ with that one is super important. When I was in college, I had a, a, there was a group that came to our school and they were singing and sharing testimonies and stuff uh, during the chapel service and I had some time I walked in and they sang a song and that song so struck my heart and you know I, I looked up the words to the song I thought about it and I was um, putting this together this week it says the title is Forgive Me My Friend it says Forgive Me My Friend I failed you. I should have realized you were watching me, hoping for a glimpse of the Christ I know. Is all you've seen just patterns, mere routines, and pious words, when what you saw was love? Forgive me, my friend. I've let you down. I haven't really shown what you wanted to see, a glimpse of Christ living in me. Forgive me and I'll try, my friend. Forgive me and I'll pray that he will live his life in me, shining forth each day. So you will see 
the joy that is you. So you will feel the peace that I know. So you will find the love he can bestow. So please forgive me, my friend, for Jesus loves you so. Who's your one? You care enough about your one to fight desperately to bring them to the Savior. Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for loving us with an unmatchless love. Father, you love us with an unconditional love. You love us so much that you sent your son to rescue us and to change us forever. And we're not what we used to be. You set us free. Father, in that freedom, we're able, we mentioned Herod Tubman last week, we're able to go back into the enemy camp and we're able to lay hold of others and bring them out to freedom. We can lead the way. We can point people to Jesus and allow them to escape the tyranny of sin and its punishment. Father, may we seek your face. May we not be content to just keep this good news to ourselves, but Father, point us to that one that you have appointed for salvation, that you want to use us to reach. Give us the courage. Give us the boldness. Give us the fortitude. Give us the wisdom to go, to show, to speak, to lead. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake.